This is the Digital Music Trends coverage of Medium 2014, an interview with a Jordan Berlian partner at The Collective. DMT's coverage is brought to you by CI, the leading provider of digital delivery services to the independent community on ci-info.com. So hi Jordan, it's uh, great to have you here and uh, how's it going today? Uh, it's kind of wet outside, but uh, I guess it means snow in the mountains, so I'm pretty happy about that. <laughs> yeah, have you got plans after meet him? <laughs> meet him and then skeet him. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about uh, the collective first of all. Would you mind giving us uh, a short introduction for the very few people that uh, might not be familiar with what the collective is and what you do? Well, uh, the collective, as its name implies, is a management company with uh, many, many internal resources. Um, and that is somewhat different than the way that most traditional management companies are structured. Most uh, management relationships with an artist is a relationship between one manager and, and the artist that he represents. The collective um, which, uh, music management department, which was formed in 2008, um, is structured to meet the needs of an artist in an ever-changing world, where more and more uh, disintermediation means more and more opportunity, requiring more and more uh, resources in order to capitalize on those opportunities. It also, um, uh, I, I guess, it's it's formed in the realization that that partners of uh, of artists, record companies, etc., um, can no longer provide the kinds of resources that they used to um, for those artists, given the uh, decline in um, in revenue and sales. And uh, you know, you're talking about that, and, and of course. Uh, one of the, the key, uh, key su to success of the collective is the fact that you really capitalized on the idea that uh, management has to change and management is becoming more and more central to the career of, of, of an artist. So uh, how much are you taking on? You know, there are, are there limits to, to what a management company can do? Uh, well, yes, there's limits to, to, to in every situation because you're, uh, you're only as effective as your artists are talented. Um, we're very fortunate at the collective in that we have um, a roster of very, very talented artists um, who are, you know, cover a lot of ground creatively. Um, so, so, uh, but you're right in, in that m we are taking on more and more responsibility um, because the, you know, the value chain has been disrupted to such a great degree. Um, there is more and more necessity to have relationship uh, with those the artists, fans, and followers. And so we're very, very aggressive in terms of uh, what we do digitally, how we approach the aggregation of our artists, fans, and how that uh, information and, and those communities are leveraged in order to bring other opportunities to the artists with brands and, um, and, and other global opportunities. Sure. Now, when you're looking at uh, brands, you know, they're becoming a, a very important piece of the puzzle when you're talking about major artists and uh, how the releases are, are scheduled and, and put together. They can really be a key part of, of a release uh, strategy as well. So, uh, you know, how, how do you see that uh, partnership uh, evolving uh, over time? Are, are brands getting music more these days? And do they understand that they have to be involved with a band for the long haul uh, sometimes as well? Well, we look, um, particularly with Linkin Park, we look for relationships that at their core are creative. Um, we're not a Formula One car where we just put logos on. Um, in order for a relationship with a brand to be successful, there's a number of criteria, a number of boxes that need to be checked. One is that, is that um, there, is, there is something creative at the core of that relationship, and so uh, I guess a good example would be our relationship with Harmon Audio, where we're relaunching the uh, Infinity brand, which we announced last month at CES. Um, we're not just there to promote Infinity, we're actually helping them create products, we're designing products from the ground up. We have a huge say in what kind of products are being brought to market, the timing of those products, and of course the design um, and, 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 the, and the sound of those products. Uh, I guess that would be um, you know, a good example of the kind of relationships that we're looking for. Um, the other thing we do that I think is rather unique is that we really focus on understanding who an artist's fan base is. We do research, qualitative research on those fans so that we understand 
not only how our artists fit into their lifestyle, but what the, we provide a picture of what that lifestyle is, what sports they like, what, how they spend their free time, what role music plays in their lives, what brands there are loyal to, what um, products they consume, um, what sports they follow. So that allows us to not only get some guidance from the fans whose voice matters more than anybody's in terms of what relationships to explore, but it also helps us explain to brands why an artist like Linkin Park and their fans are meaningful. And, and talking about uh, understanding who your fans are, uh, one key, one key uh, piece of the puzzle for a band like Linkin Park would be also to understand where, where their fans are, uh, to also uh, help with the scheduling of tours. Uh, have you seen that technology come along and are you making use of that when you're deciding where the band is going to go and how the tour is going to progress? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of information out there that will give us um, sort of a, literally a geographic roadmap to where we think that we can tour most successfully. So there's, when you're planning touring, um, you know, there's again a lot of criteria to, to evaluate in order to create the best routing and the best situation possible for the artist. Uh, and looking at uh, you know the way in which you look at videos, you know we're going to talk about that in the session later on today. But uh, first of all, uh, how are budgets allocated today? Who is paying for the video, and uh, how do you decide how much uh, you're going to spend on it? Well, for artists that are signed to labels, it's um, it seems to be a constant uh, source of friction um, b because the interests aren't aligned. And what I mean by that is, record companies are making less and less money from exploiting the rights of uh, music masters that they have. But the general population is consuming music, especially in its visual form, more and more. Yeah. Um, so you have this disparity between an increasing uh, audience that, um, that consumes video, particularly through YouTube, which is the number one place on the planet for, uh, for music, which by its nature is a primarily a visual medium. Yeah. Um, and you have that, uh, that uh, dynamic on the one hand, and then you've got record companies that used to spend three, four, five hundred thousand dollars on a video for a superstar act that now want to spend, you know, seventy five thousand. Um, and not all, by the way, not all videos are improved by money. Yeah. Um, it's generally the idea that creates the value of a video. But there's a certain threshold that if you want to create quality videos, is important and for artists that are signed in the US because uh, you know music television has all but abandoned music videos uh, it becomes a again a source of friction because internationally with, with the artists like Linkin Park um, where uh, where they're very popular in a number of places there are still uh, television channels that play music so we need quality music videos both for online and both for television, but when the budgets are created out of the US, a lot of the record companies don't really understand the, um, you know, the purpose of a video anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so uh, in that sense, are you looking at videos as a way to uh, make money these days or is it still seen as a promotional tool? Well, um, it's a lot easier to make money on videos when, um, when the record companies aren't the ones trying to monetize them. Um, uh, record companies are very good at a number of things, but being advertising agencies is certainly not one of them. Yeah. Um, again, with an artist like Linkin Park who has 1.2 billion views on YouTube, I mean the amount of revenue that's come in from that is is de minimis. Um, uh, and there are entities um, that can monetize uh, music videos effectively. In fact, at the Collective. Uh, and one of my, our sister companies there um, is a multi-channel network called the Collective Digital Studios, whose sole business is in uh, helping to create and monetize uh, video, whether it's music or otherwise. And they've done a very, very effective job. And uh, you know, I really wish that uh, that the uh, music industry would sort of follow what they do because they understand brand integration. They understand. Um, monetization, advertising, etc. Sure. And uh, looking at a band like Linkin Park, uh, you know, of course, you must get approached, uh, and uh, uh, the collective in general as as a group, you must get approached by startups all the time with new ideas of uh, 
uh, of interesting ways to present music out there. You know, how do you vet them? How do you decide which companies to work with? And is it always a risk? And you know, how, how do you decide uh, how to gauge the risk? Well, um, I mean, it's a, a very good question. There are a number of um, new technologies that approach um, Lincoln Park. You know, it seems like every week now. Yeah. Um, and so there's a process that we go through to really vet um, what these technologies are, and then we examine again whether there is something creative at the core of these technologies that is interesting and inspiring to the band. Um, and then obviously, you know, we look at what the um, you know potential to to win in that space is. Um, but it's really the band that makes these decisions. You know, our job is to. Um, to, to do the background and, and, and bring them the information that allows them to make the decision. And finally, uh, let's talk about a project that uh, you know, one, of the, uh, one of your bands has created that you've uh, been particularly proud of that you've seen uh, over the last year or so. You know, what, what would you mention uh, to me? Well, one of the things that um, I'm particularly proud of um, is Linkin Park's involvement with uh, Music for Relief, which is a charity that they founded in the aftermath of the 2004 Asian tsunamis. Um, in addition to um, having raised uh, millions and millions of dollars that have been um, allocated towards projects to help survivors of disasters on pretty much every continent of the planet, um, we've really focused uh, very diligently on uh, long-term uh, relief efforts in places like Haiti and places like Japan. And most recently, we held a uh, benefit concert in Los Angeles for the survivors of the recent typhoon in the Philippines. Um, and I'm very, very proud of, uh, you know, to be associated with guys like Lincoln Park, whose philanthropic efforts are as important to them as their success and their day job as musicians. And the fact of the matter is that they can combine those two interests to really move the dial and really help save people's lives. Um, and um, hopefully you'll, you'll all see the um, results of that effort uh, on television, because we did film it for television and um, it will start airing uh, within the next couple of weeks. So, um, we've already raised in excess of half a million dollars through those efforts and uh, hopefully the outreach via the uh, television show um, will help us raise even more money. Um, and, and again, uh, we partner with uh, non-government organizations who are on the ground uh, to provide a very specific um, uh, relief effort. Um, in, these, uh, in the aftermath of these disasters. And the other thing I'm very proud of the guys about is that they actually go to these places to see the results of what these efforts um, have achieved. That's fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time. It was a real pleasure talking to you. It was a pleasure talking to you too. And thanks so much for listening to the DMT coverage of Medium 2014. You can find everything on digitalmusictrends.com or youtube.com slash digitalmusictrends.